Kingdom of Heaven, Ridley Scott's big-budget film set during the Crusades. But is this movie historically accurate? Find out today on Real Crusades History as we dissect Kingdom of Heaven and determine what in it is truly reflective of history and what is pure fiction. Hi, welcome to Real Crusades History. I'm J. Stephen Roberts, and thank you for joining us once again for our analysis of the movie Kingdom of Heaven. This is the second part in our ongoing series, and we'll discover what in the film is historically accurate and what is inaccurate. I'm joined once more by two historians of the Crusades, Dr. Helena Schroeder and Paul Copenhagen. Helena, how are you? I'm great. It's a wonderful sunny day here in Addis Ababa. Glad to be here. Great. Thanks for being here. And Paul, how are you doing? I am doing very well. I was told this morning that we should have fun storming the castle, so I am I'm here to do that. Excellent. And thanks to you as well, Paul. So let's jump right into our second episode today. When we last left off, Godfrey of Ibelin and his son Balian were traveling through France as they made their way toward the Holy Land. As they ride across a field among a throng of pilgrims, they encounter a crazy priest who is cross-eyed and looks like he suffers from some mental illness. This priest rants loudly. To kill an infidel, the Pope has said, is not murder. It is the path to heaven. Again, this is really Scott's demonization of the medieval Christian church and its conception of the crusade. The line this priest is spouting is an absolutely false portrayal of crusade theology. In reality, the medieval church viewed the killing of Muslims during crusader warfare as an unfortunate tragedy of a just war. In A New Knighthood, Bernard of Clairvaux stressed that if there were any other way to resist Muslims, aside from conquering them with physical violence, that would be preferable. But since there is no other way, the crusade is necessary. And a crusader didn't earn his spiritual rewards by killing infidels. He earned them by the great personal sacrifice he made in going on crusade. So Scott's portrayal of the reason medieval Christians went on crusade is incorrect. I agree. I think the key point here is that the crusades were not about killing or even converting Muslims. They were about liberating the most sacred sites in Christianity, the places where Christ would have been born, preached, and died. And then, of course, ensuring the safety of Christian pilgrims who went to visit those sites. To be absolutely clear, the Crusades were a response to Muslim aggression, as Professor Rodney Stark makes um, very clear in his excellent book, uh, God's Battalions. There's a, there was a long history of atrocities committed by Muslims against the Christians in the Holy Land between 634 and 1099. Yeah, and... At no time has the church stated that salvation was found in killing, and that's something that, you know, uh, really kind of disturbed me about this scene. Uh, Muslim or otherwise, the church has never linked the two. Even the concept of a just war in the West has a somewhat dubious level of acceptance. While it's certainly a valid church theory, various various bishops uh, throughout the church history have raised objections to it. In fact, given the evidence of the church's attempts to reach peace on multiple occasions— whether we're talking about Leo the Great speaking with Attila the Hun outside of the walls of Rome and getting him to turn his armies away, uh, to the peace and truce of God, uh, limiting combat seasons, days of the weeks, and even legitimate targets, uh, to the point where basically it would have been impossible under the terms of the peace and truce of God to wage war. The Church did its utmost to end violence. Uh, This is more of Scott's attempt to show, as a storyteller, that the kingdom of heaven was an ideal and uh, Christianity, uh, they both have nothing in common. Godfrey and Balian stop to camp, and they meet Guy of Lusignan, who Scott establishes as his stereotypical mean villain by having Guy make a joke about Balian being a bastard. Weirdly, Guy spends the entire movie dressed like a Templar, and the only purpose for this seems to be that Scott wants to associate the Templars with badness. Yeah, I was actually baffled by Lusignan's attire when I first saw it in the movie. Um, since Templars were monks who vowed poverty as well as obedience and chastity, a man had to renounce his inheritance, regardless of what that was, before joining the Templars. So it would have been impossible for a ruling king to be a Templar. And when I first saw, you know, this character in the Templar um, habit, I, I couldn't figure out if it was Guy de Lusignan because it was absurd that a ruling king would be wearing a Templar habit. 
I guess another problem with the scene, of course, is that Guy never returned to the West after he went out to Outremer in 1180. So it also would have been impossible for Godry and Bailey, and who are in the movie in Italy at this time, to run into him. Yeah, it's definitely a storytelling element. Um, he's trying to link Renaud de Chatillon, Guy de Lusignan, and the Templars as a, a whole organization and the upcoming poor decision making. Uh, later on in the movie, there's actually like a, a Templar chaplain who seems to echo every decree or decision Guy makes with God wills it. And he kind of shakes his little hand there, uh, which harkens back to the Council of Clermont when uh, Urban II declared that the, that knights should travel east to support the Byzantine Empire in uh, the reconquest of his territories. Godfrey and Balian next show up at Messina, the port in Italy from which they will sail to the Holy Land. Scott gives us a fairly wide image of this bustling port town. Helena, Paul, what do you think of Scott's imagining of this town? Accurate? I didn't see anything overtly outrageous. What about you, Paul? Um, the only thing that strikes me is the location itself. Messina, being on the coast of Sicily, uh, Venice, Genoa, Naples, they're all far closer to France and also popular embarking points for the Crusaders. Um, that's how the ill-fated Fourth Crusade got uh, snookered into attacking the Eastern Empire. The Venetians had all the ships and they were otherwise stuck. But beyond that, nothing is particularly out of the ordinary. I think probably Scott chose this piece um, for the scene of the Muslims praying. You know, further north in towns such as Genoa and Venice, you didn't really have that sort of Muslim population in the 12th century to justify them being out and about and praying. But southern Italy certainly had its fair share. Uh, beyond that, Messina is pretty accurate, all things considered. While waiting to sail, Godfrey lies on his deathbed. Balian sits beside him. Godfrey says to his son Balian, Do you know what is found in the Holy Land? A new world. A man who in France had not a house. Is in the Holy Land the master of a city? He who was the master of a city in the Holy Land begs in the gutter. There, at the end of the world, you are not what you were born, but what you have in it yourself to be. A better world than has ever been seen. Scott is clearly drawing this from Fulcare of Chartres' description of the Holy Land, which he wrote in the decades after the conquest of Jerusalem. What do you think, Helena? Yeah, this is clearly Scott using um, Fulcher's original quote and modifying it substantially. The original quote says, Westerners have become Orientals. The Italian and Frenchmen of yesteryear have become men of Galilee or Palestine. The colonist has now become a native, and the immigrant is one of the inhabitants. By the grace of God, he who was poor attains riches here. He who had no more than a few deniers finds himself here in possession of a fortune. He who owned not so much as one village finds himself, by the grace of God, the lord of a city. I'd like to point out that what Fulcher is actually saying is was making two points. On the one hand, that the residents of the Crusader kingdoms had new identities, that they felt themselves to be men of Galilee or Palestine, and no longer Frenchmen or Spaniards or whatever they had been before. And the second, of course, is that this was a land of opportunity. It was a land of opportunity. The Latin settlers in the Crusader states were never serfs. And even those working in agriculture had the status of free burghers. Um, furthermore, Crusader society was far more urbanized, which means it was uh, more urbanized in Western society at this time, is what I mean. And that means that as much as 50% of the population lived in cities. Um, the cities, obviously, were the were the home of the middle class. Most of these settlers who came out to Ultramar were, in fact, middle class before they even came out, because it took a certain amount of money to finance this, this very long pilgrimage. And serfs, of course, wouldn't have been able to leave their land because they were serfs and tied to the land. So the most of the travelers who went out to the Crusader Kingdom were craftsmen, tradesmen, and skilled workers. They were the middle class of the Middle Ages. As for the nobility, with the exception of the, the families that became the, the major, the counts, the kings, the most of the, the people, who, the noblemen who went on crusade or went on armed pilgrimage, as it was called, were the younger sons. And those who remained in the Holy Land were therefore the descendants of younger sons, such as Beres and Edelon, Reynaud de Chatillon, Amory and Guy de Lozignan themselves. And they had indeed, as younger sons in a time of primogeniture, not owned so much as a single village at home, but they became barons, princes, and of course, in the case of Guy de Lozignan, a king in Outremer. Fascinating. But then Scott puts the following words in Godfrey's mouth. A kingdom of conscience a kingdom of heaven. There is peace between Christian and Muslim. We live together, or between Saladin and the king, we try. 
Did you think that that lay at the end of Crusade? It does. Godfrey's speech here is about how Saladin and King Baldwin IV are supposedly establishing a, quote, kingdom of conscience in the Holy Land. This is where Scott completely veers away from anything even remotely resembling an accurate portrayal of the Crusades era. Neither Saladin nor Baldwin IV was interested in creating some sort of paradise of religious pluralism. Medieval people had a different conception of conscience. For Saladin and Baldwin IV, it would have been against their conscience to not fight for the aggrandizement of their religious traditions. Basically, at this point, if it wasn't already clear, we now understand that Ridley Scott is not making a movie about the medieval crusades, but rather telling a modern story in medieval costume. Let's not forget that Saladin had declared jihad against the Christian kingdoms, and at no time, not even for a minute I would argue, did he entertain peaceful coexistence with them. Even on his deathbed, he allegedly said that he wished he had lived long enough to drive all the Christians off the face of the earth. So Baldwin IV, although he was condemned by his physical disabilities, and the comparative balance of power into fighting predominantly defensive wars, was not fool enough to think that he could uh, achieve peaceful coexistence with someone who declared jihad against his kingdom. He took the war to the enemy whenever he could, and he fought for his own kingdom with a tenacity and incredible willpower, which I think should be admired, even as, as his body decayed upon his bones. Indeed, you know, the concept of religious freedom uh, with that religious plurality was largely a Christian notion. Uh, the First Crusade ensured it with protecting the freedom of unarmed pilgrims to complete their pilgrimage, uh, which was the raison d'etre of the uh, Knights Templar. Uh, in fact, the Treaty of Ramla that ends the Third Crusade reinforces this right of pilgrimage over Saladin's objections. Uh, the Jihad, unlike the Crusade, was an all-or-nothing endeavor. The Crusaders at least seemed to be somewhat content with uh, the enforced religious freedoms. After this, Balian walks outside with a knight who explains that when the conquest of Jerusalem was accomplished, the Crusaders also captured the seaports on the coast of Syria and Palestine. The knight says, And so Italy becomes rich, as the Savior intended. This, of course, is accurate, and I would say that this knight's attitude is an accurate attitude for a 12th century man. The Crusaders in general did believe that their prosperity was a sign of God's favor. Yeah, indeed, the Italian city-states uh, really did get rich on this trade with, with the East, and it was that exchange of goods, technology, and ideas, technology, they're saying, uh, it's really key here, that an exchange with Byzantine and the Crusader states and through the Crusader states with Egypt and the rest of the East that fostered that culture of flourishing that we've come to call the Renaissance. Absolutely. And, of course, uh, the emergent mer merchant naval powers such as Venice and Genoa they grow a great deal due to this wealth, uh, so much so that the tiny, most serene republic of Venice can, militarily speaking, punch well above its weight later on in history. Okay, so next we see a scene of Balian sitting eating a meal when Guy of Lusignan approaches him, rather out of the blue, and tells him, When the king is dead, Jerusalem will have no place for friends of Muslims or traitors to Christendom like your father. Ridley Scott portrays this false divide within the Christian world of the Middle Ages between those who are tolerant like Balian and those who are intolerant like Guy. The truth is no such conflict existed in medieval Christendom. Pretty much all 12th century Christians agreed that the Crusades were a good thing and that conquering Muslim territory and turning it over to Christian rule was desirable. Since in the medieval conception of the universe, alignment with the correct religion would have been essential to the proper ordering of society. However, at the same time, your average medieval Christian, while holding this belief, would have had no problem interacting with Muslims on a daily basis if he lived in a region in which they lived, such as through business associations in the marketplace or the like. I agree that while the medieval man saw Christianity as the only truly religion, the residents and rulers of the Crusader states were, in fact, remarkably tolerant of other forms of Christianity. And remember, most of the residents of Outremer were either Muslim Jews or predominantly Orthodox Christians. There were no pogroms in the Crusader kingdoms. And indeed, the Muslims, like the Jews and the Orthodox Christians, were allowed to practice their religion according to their own rights with no interference. So the Muslims even had the right to the Hajj in some places. We know specifically um, in Nablus, for example. And, you know, I would argue there were fewer restrictions 
on religious practice and less intolerance under the Christian rulers of the Crusader states than there had been before the First Crusade under the Muslim rulers. This is something that's often misrepresented in literature, and they'll talk about how much the Orthodox Christians, you know, had enjoyed freedom under the Muslims, but that's flat out not true. We know that the Muslims prohibited intermarriage between the faiths. They punished conversion to Christianity with death. By the way, they still do in many Islamic countries. Um, even, well, Sudan, for example, there was a recent case where they tried to carry that out. We managed to get the American out. Um, but anything that was remotely resembled an insult to Islam was likewise a serious crime. And again, that's still true today. Um, just recently, there was a man condemned in Saudi Arabia to a thousand lashes and 10 years imprisonment for a blogging entry, which the Saudi authorities interpreted as an insult to the Quran. Um, as I say, in fact, any kind of doubting of Islamic dogma is punishable then as now as a crime. Um, so the Christians who had made up 50% of the population of the Holy Land at the time of the First Crusade and even into the time of the Crusader Kingdom were subject to special taxes. They were frequently victims of persecution and uh, they suffered a lot of, of, a lot of abuses. Um, by contrast, the Muslims in the Crusader states, although subject to special taxes, were not subject to persecution and were not prohibited from public worship of their, in their own winter. Even Muslim observers noted that Muslim peasants in the Caucasus states lived better than their compatriots in neighboring Syria. Yeah, and we also get out of this period references to the Templars uh, supporting the notion of Christian tolerance. Uh, there are, are many stories that emerge uh, from Muslim historians where they actually stop this more closed-minded attitude. Uh, Samad ibn Munkid uh, relates a story how a Frankish knight invites uh, a Muslim merchant to dine at his estate. He serves this merchant on his way to Antioch, um, and the merchant was concerned about the quality of the meal uh, because obviously non-Muslims don't necessarily observe the dietary restrictions of Islam. Uh, but he assures him that this is all prepared by Egyptian cooks. So he serves him what would be a halal meal. And as the man goes forth another day, uh, this Frankish woman accuses him of murdering her brother in a marketplace. Uh, this brother was a knight named Urso, and as the crowd kind of gathers around, this this knight uh, that had served him the f prior day comes to his defense. He disperses the crowd, telling the woman that she's got the wrong man, and that she should leave this peaceful merchant alone. Uh, in another passage, uh, even Munkid even remarks sarcastically uh, that there is another example of Frankish barbarism when a young Templar freshly arrived to the Holy Land attempts to correct the direction of a Muslim man's prayers. He says, and I quote, Whenever I went into the mosque, which was in the hands of Templars who were friends of mine, they would put the little oratory at my disposal so that I could say my prayers there. He goes on to detail how his friends, the Templars, stopped a recent arrival in the Holy Land from two or three times trying to correct him because this freshly arrived Templar, full of the religious zeal, supposedly, that uh, Scott tries to force on the Templar order, uh, he had never seen a Muslim pray in any direction except east. And this Templar was afraid for the Muslims since he was obviously praying in what the Templar perceived to be the wrong direction. This is completely at odds with Scott's portrayal, both of the average Christian knight and the Templars who occupied the Holy Land. All right, in the next scene, we see Balian knighted by his dying father. Godfrey uses these words, Be without fear in the face of your enemies. Be brave and upright that God may love thee. Speak the truth. Always, even if it leads to your death, safeguard the helpless and do no wrong. Defend the king. If the king is no more, protect the people. Helena and Paul, what do you think of this oath? Accurate? Wait, wait, wait. You just skipped over one of the most incredibly stupid pieces of this movie. The notion that Godfrey could, with a stroke of his sword, make this allegedly illegitimate son his heir and a baron of Jerusalem. That's just not the way things were done in the kingdom of Jerusalem or, in fact, anywhere in the medieval world. Um, the Kingdom of Jerusalem had very clear, precise, and sophisticated laws of inheritance. However, it is correct that in the late 12th century, any knight can make another knight. Um, the famous case is William Marshall knighting King Henry II's eldest son and heir. Um, anyways, but there was no definitive knighting formula as far as I know any time in history. Maybe Paul has more details than that. 
certainly not in the 12th century. But as I say, whether you can make a knight or not, it would not have been possible for a knight or baron to simply wash away the stigma of illegitimacy and overturn the laws of inheritance. Had a baron of Jerusalem died without legitimate heirs of his body, his barony would have passed first to his closest male relative, his brother, his nephew, his cousin, assuming that male was resident in the kingdom, or it would have reverted to the crown, and the king would then have bestowed the barony on whomsoever he found worthy. So this is one of the things in the movie that really grates most on my nerves. It shows a complete ignorance of medieval laws and the fact that medieval man was very legalistic. Wouldn't you agree with that, Paul? Absolutely. You know, if there's anything that separates the medieval landowning noble from everyone else in the Western world, it's the fascination and devotion to succession laws or pedigree. Uh, succession laws are responsible for everything from the Battle of Stamford Bridge uh, to the Battle of Hastings, where Harold Godwinson at the, at the former battle fights uh, Harold Hadrada uh, and Tostig Godwinson, his own brother. And, uh, of course, Battle of Hastings between Harold Godwinson and William Normandy. Both occur in 1066, where three different claimants all claim legitimacy to the English throne after the childless death of Edward the Confessor. Less than 100 years later, you have another succession crisis in the same country because the question arose as to who Henry I's legitimate heir was. Uh, King Stephen faced off against Empress Maud, who was the legitimate daughter of Henry I, but of course they had questions as to whether or not inheritance could pass through a female line. Uh, this is to say nothing of the Hundred Years' War, the Wars of the Roses, and dozens of other medieval conflicts that tore entire nations apart at the seams. All these wars and others were fought to determine who is next in line for the throne. Uh, the concept of simply legitimizing a bastard and no one questions it or moves on uh, is ludicrous. You know, heck, people question legitimate successions all the time. Of course, for the purposes of storytelling, it's easier for him to be legitimized so quickly but the medieval man's life, death, and the lives of millions of others could very well hang in the balance as to who was next in line. Okay, so next, Balian sails for Jerusalem. The voyage is stormy, and his ship is broken. We see Balian washed onto the shores of Palestine with the wreckage of the ship. Of course, Balian alone, our hero, is the survivor of this deadly wreck, which kills absolutely everyone else. Next, Balian meets an as-yet-anonymous Arab, who later, we will learn, is one of Saladin's leading captains, Imad ad-Din. Imad ad-Din pretends to be a servant and tricks Balian into fighting his real servant, who is pretending to be the Lord, for the purpose of testing Balian's virtue. Rather ironically, the battle that results ends in Balian killing Imad ad-Din's servant. Imad doesn't seem at all disturbed by any of this, which seems bizarre for your typical Arab nobleman. This seems like Scott totally abandoning any portrayal of history for pure symbolism and allegory. As I understand it, this little story he portrays actually comes from a Walter Scott novel. Frankly, this whole scene is so ridiculously implausible that I don't know that it deserves comment. But since we're commenting, um, horses, for example, were transported on, the sling, on slings in the bellies of ships. And it's quite possible that a horse could have broken free in some sort of a wreck and it swum ashore. I'm sure they did but they wouldn't have been in some sort of a cage where Balian could then easily, easily capture them. Um, the fact that Balian would have been the sole survivor and then completely unharmed is pretty ridiculous, as you say. That he would have then encountered just two Arabs, one of whom was a famous Emer, is also rather ridiculous. The coast would probably have been inhabited by Greek or Armenian Christian communities. There were more fishermen who were Christian than were Arab in descent to Arab and Turkish. And the emperor, if he had been traveling along this coastal stretch for some reason, would have been traveling in a large entourage. So I'd say this isn't just bad history, it's bad fiction. Yeah, it's both bad history and bad fiction. Uh, that said, can I at least say that I enjoyed Siddig al Fadil's portrayal of uh, Imad uh, Dean in this? You know, it, it's really about the best thing I can say for the whole scene. They did a good job with the casting. Now Balian and the still anonymous Imad ad Dean travel to Jerusalem. We get a view of the close, confined, dusty streets, the pilgrims, merchants, and soldiers bustling about. I've always liked the atmosphere in this scene, although I'm not sure how accurate it is in terms of if it's similar to how medieval Jerusalem actually felt. Uh, my feelings are that it's at least somewhat accurate. Balian next tells Imad that he can go about his business. Imad ad -Din looks surprised and says, I am your prize in battle, your slave. And Balian responds, I have been a slave, or near to one, and will not keep any, nor suffer any to be kept. 
Imad ad-Din replies, Your quality will be known among your enemies before ever you meet them, my friend. As he rides away, having served his purpose as a plot device. What strikes me about this scene... In the medieval world, Christians believed it was wrong to keep other Christians as slaves, but wasn't it considered acceptable to enslave Muslims or other non-Christians? Also, it seems inaccurate that Balian would be equating his status back in Europe as a serf. I'm assuming that's what he means, though blacksmiths generally weren't serfs, of course, with slavery, which seems like a comparison that a modern post-enlightenment mind would be making rather than a medieval one. Yeah, I'd say you're 100% correct to object to Bailey and suggesting that his status had been close to slavery. But there really is a world of difference between a serf and being a slave. Serfs had pretty substantial rights, actually, in most of medieval Europe. And medieval men knew there was a difference between serfdom and slavery, because they knew what their rights were if they were serfs. I'd also be very careful, but I would be careful about saying that medieval man was comfortable with the concept of slavery. It's certainly a Western medieval man would have not never would have been comfortable with it. Slavery in Scandinavia and Germany had ended with the spread of Christianity, and the Latin Church clearly opposed the enslavement of fellow Christians. So Balian, who in the film is just coming out of the West, probably wouldn't have been very have ever encountered slavery before in his life. Let's just put it that way. Um, the Orthodox Christians, as good descendants of the Romans, did retain slaves. And contact with the Islamic world would have exposed the residents of Ultramar to slavery. So there may have been more acceptance there. However, I'm not really even sure about that. I've never seen a serious study of slaves in the Crusader kingdom. And I'm not willing to accept the conventional wisdom that the Crusader states employed captive slave labor. I've really never seen it done. What about Paul, you, Paul? Have you ever seen anything specific on slavery in the Crusader states? Um, in Crusader society, even in European society, slavery was not much of an issue until Europe breaks beyond the Atlantic with the Age of Sail. Uh, slavery was acceptable, but fairly rare due to the fact that European culture, in European culture, there just weren't that many non-Christians around to enslave. Uh, Jews and other non-Christians would actually uh, have been special subjects of the king. Uh, so there have been several books, uh, especially on uh, the melting pot of Spain, where it points out this special relationship of the Jews of Spain to the crown itself. Uh, I can only imagine in the Crusader states that they would have followed this pattern. And given that the Muslim historians themselves are actually pretty silent on the issue of slavery speaks volumes. Uh, because while staying silent on the issue of slavery, they make specific mention of the concept of ransom, which, as we've previously discussed, is a rather time-honored European tradition. Your average prisoner of war taken by a Christian isn't going to be bound in slavery for life. Uh, they're actually going to be ransomed. A slave costs money to feed, house, and maintain, and generally has a pretty poor work ethic due to their bondage. Uh, a hefty ransom from a wealthy merchant or a nobleman is going to pay for dozens of servants who also get to appreciate the fruits of their labor, both in terms of coin and the goods they produce for you as your servant. Next, we find Balian waking up in a lavish suite, then bathing in a luxurious bath, while attended by sexy Arabian women. I, I rather like showing the bath here because bathing was very much a part of medieval culture. Certainly in the Holy Land, there were lots of public as well as private baths. And interestingly, archaeologists can tell the difference between the baths built by Christians and those built by Muslims because they have a distinctive architecture that archaeologists can identify them by. And this you know, goes back to what we discussed in episode one. Uh, this is the first bath that we've seen, and where do we see it? In Utremar. You know, we see no indications of hygiene in the European scenes, but it's definitely, you know, a good thing to show show the baths, whether, you know, it's uh, here in Utrecht or not, uh, because they were such an important part of that culture. In the next scene, Balian is sitting around talking to the Hospitaller Knight, who had accompanied Godfrey in France. How find you Jerusalem? The Hospitaller asks. God does not speak to me, Balian answers in a rather moody, brooding tone. I am outside of God's grace. I have lost my religion. The Hospitaller Knight, a member of a military order of monks dedicated entirely to religion, replies, I put no stock in religion. By the word religion, I've seen the lunacy of fanatics of every denomination called the will of God. I've seen too much religion in the eyes of too many murderers. Holiness is in right action and courage on behalf of those who cannot defend themselves and goodness 
As usual, Scott cannot bring himself to allow his medieval characters to have medieval viewpoints. A Hospitaller Knight puts no stock in religion? Bizarre. Why would someone devote themselves to being a warrior monk in the Holy Land if he puts no stock in religion? Instead, this monk thinks that all that matters is defending the defenseless. That certainly was very important to medieval knights, but not as important as the veneration of God. And the Crusades were about defending the Holy Sepulchre first. I disagree with that, Steve. The Crusades were first and foremost about making the pilgrimage safe again and freeing oppressed Orthodox Christians. And only after that about liberating the Holy Sepulchre. The rest, as you say, is fiction. It's very unlikely the Hospitaller would have had that, such doubts, but it's not totally inconceivable. As for Balian, well, as I've said repeatedly, the historical Balian was born in Outremer, raised as a knight, very devout, and incidentally married to a Byzantine princess by this time in his life. So the character portrayed here has nothing to do with, with the real historical Balian. Indeed, the knightly orders were, at the very least, were devoted to the pilgrims. Uh, certainly, there is emphasis on protecting the holy sites, uh, but the pilgrims and oppressed Christians of the region certainly were the forefront. After all, what is an empty church, if not just a building with pretty decorations? The Crusaders understood this, and to the average person who would go east, the beaten and battered pilgrim was a much greater incentive than the thought of a desecrated church that you didn't attend, had never seen, and were never likely to worship in it. Hospitallers, uh, Templars, Knights of Santiago, the Knights of the Sword of Livonia, these were all men who were so moved by their faith that they took up religion and chose to devote their lives to it, and even as Dr. Schroeder said before, uh, these were people who not only devoted their lives to it, but gave up property and marriage and succession, the symbols of medieval status, to devote their lives to it. Yeah, I certainly don't mean to discount how seriously the Crusaders took the defense of the pilgrims and the Eastern Christians, but I think what I really find wrong with this scene between the Hospitaller and Balian is how the Hospitaller is discounting the central motivation behind the Crusades. This is the High Middle Ages, the age of great devotion to relics, and Jerusalem, as the place where Christ walked, died, rose from the dead, had been made intensely sacred, and therefore was the ultimate relic. And indeed, it was the physically tangible nature of the Holy Sepulchre that made it something anyone in Western Christendom at the time could relate to, even the simplest person. Thomas Madden says that it was the physical sight of the Holy Sepulchre itself, made sacred by contact with the divine, that was so central to the Crusades. After all, the pilgrims who went to Jerusalem were there to praise God and venerate and protect his holy city. Next, we get another totally bizarre scene in which a group of Templars are being executed by the government of the Kingdom of Jerusalem for, quote, killing Arabs. The Hospitaller tells Balian that the king holds Jerusalem as a place for prayer for all faiths. This is not true, of course. During the Crusader occupation, Jerusalem was reserved for Christian worship. There were no mosques or synagogues allowed in the city. This is because the Crusaders held Jerusalem to be so sacred it could not be defiled by the presence of infidel religion. So they are dying for what the Pope would command them to do, the movie Balian says of these Templars. Yes, says the Hospitaller, but not what Christ commands. I'd say this scene is bizarre in a number of ways. If you say the Holy City was the only part of the Crusader kingdoms where Jews and Muslims were not allowed to practice their religion freely. More important, the King of Jerusalem had no jurisdiction over the Knights of the Temple and could not have ex ordered their execution no matter what crime they had committed, I mean, even if they'd been killing Christians. So you may remember that the Templars um, once murdered an assassin envoy who had a royal safe conduct, but King Almor could not even seize the murderers. All he could do was complain to the Pope and then ask the Pope to take disciplinary action. Yeah, indeed. Uh, even when the Templars are later put on trial across Europe, the Pope and the ecclesiastical courts were the final word on their guilt or innocence. The holy city itself was certainly reserved for Christianity. The Templars could be found guilty of crimes and turned over to the civil authorities, such as the King of Jerusalem. Uh, they were first have to go through a lengthy trial under church jurisdiction, and more often than not, instead of execution for murder, the rather wealthy church, uh, as well as the order itself, would settle for a blood price or some other sort of remuneration. 
Uh, while many civil authorities certainly applied capital punishment for murder, we would more likely see well-trained knights weighed against their deaths. Uh, their deaths would be utterly meaningless. Uh, but blood prices and that sort of compensation was a rather long-standing, even pre-Christian idea in the West. And with that, we conclude our second installment in our analysis of Kingdom of Heaven. Helena, Paul, I want to thank you both once more for being with me. Helena, would you please let everyone know where they can check out some of your writings and scholarship? Yes, thank you very much. I have two websites. One is um, Helena P. Schroeder, all one word, dot com, which is all about all of my books. And the one which is focused on the kingdom of Jerusalem and Valian is Defender of Jerusalem, all one word, dot com. And Paul, I certainly hope you'll keep us abreast of everything you're doing in terms of your writings and your articles. Absolutely. Great. And thanks to everyone for listening. Please join us again next Monday night on the Real Crusades History YouTube channel for part three in our dissection of the film Kingdom of Heaven.